right, welcome back to 102.7 Chop FM, Wednesday night with the Nerds of the North. Just for our nostalgic break there, we started you off with Wham! Careless Whisper. Following up from the Sailor Moon American soundtrack, that was Give Me the Strength to Carry On. And finally, from the Back to the Future film, that was Huey Lewis and the News with Back in Time. Now, we announced earlier on in the show that we are going to have a special guest on our in here with us in the booth, and we do. And I'll let pass over the mic here so he can introduce himself. Here you go. Hello, uh, my name is Jack Buchanan. I have a, I'm a YouTube producer and I have a channel called Big Jack Films. And uh, all I really do is like either movie reviews, animated films, or just films in general. So um, yeah. Well, it was the films in general thing that actually got my attention because you're actually a local filmmaker now. Yeah, I um, um, usually with uh, friends on weekends, we make movies on our spare time. Uh, when I was uh, started making films uh, years ago, um, it was essentially done on the old VHS tapes. Yes. And then I moved on to DV camera doing Lego films. And then I just, I mostly used whatever I had to make my films. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that was a real breakthrough is once I got a laptop, I started doing stuff on the old Lego Studio software back in the day and started doing animated films and posting them on YouTube. And a lot of those films have gotten a huge following. Um, my Lego Jaws reenactment probably has about 700,000 hits now. That's good. And I'm reaching, I'm almost at 2,000 subscribers. I'm about 1,700 at the moment. And uh, so I started doing like little Lego short films with stop motion animation and eventually moved on to doing movie reenactments. And then once I got a, a, a digital camera and everything, then I started, uh, I thought, I want to start doing live action films. So around 2010, I stopped doing animation, and I, I've been working on nonstop, t- to this day, a full-fledged remake of King Kong, but it's, like, done in a home movie style um, point. And it has, I have to say, like, it does look really, really well done from what I've seen of it. Thank you. Uh, I remember running into you at the convention, and you actually made the CBC News at the, co- at the March Comic Con when it was you and your friend dressed up as Kong and the T-Rex, and you guys had almost a fight out in the middle of the convention theater. Yeah, that the was those were the costumes we actually used in the movie, and um, it was I think it was like before we started shooting even, and we uh, we had these suits, so we thought you know why don't we try working these out yeah uh, somewhere to get a feel of the suit. So I um, I was in the Rex suit actually. And uh, my friend Bradley was in the Kong suit, and we just fought it out, and we got a bit of attention there. Yeah, I'll say you got some attention. Like it, it cleared out the arena, and you were right there ready for news cameras. Here's Kong and the T-Rex going at it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of the film is um, – I started shooting this – like, we, we filmed this thing, principal photography, with all my actors who are friends from high school, and we shot it mm-hmm. on weekends. We shot this thing from May of 2011 until October 2013, so – I had no idea how long this was going to last, and I and I learned a lot of filmmaking from hands-on experience. Oh yeah, and uh, essentially, yeah, it just took three years to make. It was also the fact that we didn't have an actress, and we didn't have an actress till the third year. Yeah, and then we finished the movie. Um, and then this year, I worked on all the special effects. My whole summer was nothing but shooting all practical effects because when it comes to special effects, I love practical effects. So puppets, stop motion. So Kong, the majority of Kong was done with a guy in a suit. The dinosaurs are mostly claymation stop motion, which I've done on my own. And um, a lot of it's being put together at the moment. Uh, the trailer is on my channel. And uh, I am I have another year to work on it yep. because I have to do sound mixing and post-production. But um, it's coming out really well. I'm really surprised how it's turning out. Can, I've done a little bit of film editing and work in myself in the past. And that... I looked at that trail and like this. This is a good job for an indie development, especially something that you said you've taken time. It's just friends getting together to do it, and it's mostly a weekend production. The budget was actually about three thousand dollars out of my own money. So that, and you know what? It I would have assumed it was going to be more because it looks really well done, and it just goes to show that if you have the passion for something and take the time you're going to get decent results. You can clearly see when you're looking at the trailer, there's a director with a good vision there, and there's someone who knows how to edit. Because that is relatively well cut together. A lot of that was me. I didn't... I I actually edit everything on my own. Yeah, compared to some of the movie trailers I have seen recently, 
that is a good quality movie trailer. The trailer was kind of done in that old school 90s trailers for like the old Jurassic Park trailers and stuff mm -hmm. um, and so on because a lot of those films really influenced me in becoming a filmmaker. Yeah, and th well, that's right into our first question here. So is that... Like, was it uh, the original 90s films, or was it right back to uh, Back to the Future that started you wanting to there do this? There was about four elements that had me become a filmmaker and said, this is what you got to do with your life. Uh, three of them were films. One of them was a place. Uh, my top three favorite films of all time are um, the original Star Wars, which I remember seeing that when the uh, pr I saw the pre-special edition VHS tapes, yes. right? Yes. And the first images, I was about three when that when I saw um, the first images of Star Wars I ever saw was um, a trailer by voice actor Jim Cummings. He did the trailer uh, for that. And I watched that, and I'm like, that is incredible. So I watched all the original trilogies. Then I saw the special editions in theaters. Then I saw the prequels, and um, I'm, I'm excited for the new one. And, you know, we give George Lucas such bad credit, but you know what? He's my personal hero because he not only created an amazing world – but the way he shot the original Star Wars was absolutely incredible. The stuff that he had to do and the fighting he had to do with the system to get it done the way he wanted. Yeah. Like, if you've gone through and watched all the behind-the-scenes features and everything, they actually threatened to pull Empire, and they threatened to take the director's license away from Irvin Kirshner because... Because they were Luke... realizing Star Wars was making so much money. Well, because Lucas wanted to not do the screen credits at the start of the movie. Yeah. All over that. Wow. It that's, was just because insane. of that. So they, they charged him, I think, over $50 million. Wow. Because he wanted to preserve the cinematic opening of his theater mm -hmm. experience. But now he changes everything. <laughs> well, that's the one thing that I think will never change. And it's like a James Bond film. Sure, the James Bond film, after about 10 minutes in, you get those screen credits... But everybody knows Bond for how a Bond film starts. Yeah. Everybody knows Star Wars for how a Star Wars film starts. You change that, you fundamentally change Star Wars. All I hope is with Episode Seven, if we don't see that outbreak crawl, then it's all oh, for nothing. I, the crawl's there. Yeah. Um, the other film, the other film that's uh, my personal favorite is Jurassic Park. Um, I, I remember that being a huge thing when I was a kid. I was a kid of the '90s. All my friends had the toys. I had the toys. And um, we watched the movie religiously on VHS. I was actually scared of that movie. That movie's a genuine horror film, I think. It is sense. very well done. Um, I actually, we went and saw it just this past year when it came back into theaters. Oh, yeah, same, same. I saw an IMAX 3D Midnight Showing. And going. aside from the fact that the lens flare seemed to be like a giant cardboard cutout now. Yeah. Because it wasn't well encoded for 3D. Yeah. Those dinosaurs stand the test of they time. They still look great. Better than any CGI in a while. Like, there's... Jurassic Park and essentially uh, the 2005 King Kong, which I'll get to in a minute, still have some really good CGI. There's like, a there's, yeah, there's a way to use CGI, and then there's a way to overuse it. Yeah, so um, Jurassic Park, great. Lost World, I actually think is really unappreciated. I absolutely, I think it's a great film. Lost World was the one that scared me because of the compies. Yeah, those, I didn't are, those like, little things are terrifying. I didn't like them. Those those bothered but me. But Jurassic Park three terrible film it it was i remember seeing that at nine years old in the theater and half hour in once the t-rex got its neck snapped i left the theater that was the first time i ever walked out of something it and i reviewed all three films on my channel so you can definitely go check that out um and then of course jurassic world which is one of the best movies in a long time in a very long time, I think. I'm going. To, I'm waiting until I actually get my hands on a Blu-ray copy to watch it then. You haven't seen it? I haven't seen it in theaters. Oh my god, you should have seen it in theaters! I didn't get a chance. I was <sighs> busy doing other things at the time. I didn't get a chance to see that film. So I'm going to wait and let the Blu-ray speak for itself, and I'll go right into my own review for that. Yeah, just, just go in it and think of it as a direct sequel to the first one, so... Um, but the one film that is my personal favorite film or series of films is anything to do with King Kong. Yes. Uh, I love the original 1933 classic. Um, that was I remember seeing that. My uncle showed me that when I was about three years old on VHS. We watched that. Then we watched King Kong Lives. And then we watched Jaws 1 and 2. But I, I watched that, and um, I wasn't as interested as I am now in the film, but that was the first time I saw it. Um, the Peter Jackson film, I feel... It's, it, it's not the fact that it's long. It's just I like to point out it's not as good as the first draft because if you read that first draft that was made in the 90s, it's so much better than what they turned out. But the one that I love the most is the 1976 film with Jeff Bridges and Jessica Lange. That movie, mm -hmm. 
the way it's shot, the massiveness of the the mass of that film film, the scope of it, yes. is what sells it. And Kong looks huge in this film. And I th- that is my personal favorite film of all time. And he's only supposed to be, like, what, about 60 feet? Uh, the original Kong was 25 feet. The 76 film is about 50 feet. He's yeah. about 50 feet. Which really gets weird when you start seeing the King Kong versus Godzilla films, and you're like, how does this work? Yeah, like, Godzilla yeah. would drop kick him. That's why I'm concerned about <laughs> the new Skull Island movie coming out. Um, I'm, oh, I'm totally excited for it, don't get me wrong, but it's going to be a different thing. It's not going to be the, yeah. what the Kongs were. Everything takes creative license, and that's primarily the main thing when it comes to filmmaking is you're going to – you just ad- – ad- sorry. Acknowledge the fact you're going to be influenced by things. You're going to be influenced by what you like. You're going to be influenced by what you hate. These things are going to come out in what in your work. It's just bound to happen. Don't hide from it. Yeah. They're part of what who, they're part of who you are. Put who you are onto film. And honestly, you can see that in your Kong film. Yeah. You the, can see the love of King Kong in this. We tried to basically take all the Kong films and mesh it into a giant sandwich to please everybody. Um, Like, the only thing that might set people off is that it does take place in present time instead of the 30s. It's supposed to be, like, kind of... It's it's supposed to be, like, if Kong was made in the 90s. There's only so much you can do, though. Yeah. And, honestly, you can go back and have it be redone in the 30s. That would have been a lot harder to do. Because you would have to change everything. Yeah, like, Jackson pulled that off. Like, that was one of the best parts of the film, is that they made it a period piece, and it and it looked great. Yes. Visually, it looked great. All I'm saying is that that's, it was just too... It was like the 90s remake of Psycho. It's a shot-for-shot, shot, line for line when each Kong film should be its own different thing. Right. That's part of my problem with remakes in general. Mm-hmm. Don't do a remake. If you want to do a reimagining, that's fine. But at the same time... Give remakes a break. There's so many other things that you can do. Yeah. Like, you don't... Like, the story of King Kong can be done in so many different ways. You don't keep have to keep needing to make the exact same thing over. Yeah. Which is, again, why I'm also interested in seeing Skull Island. Because it doesn't look like they're following old school, here's what we're doing. Yeah. It is, no, we have King Kong, but it's a new story. Yeah. And the no one problem with that. The one location that really started my sparked me to say, okay, I gotta make movies now. I remember visiting Universal Studios Florida in its prime back in like nineteen ninety eight with my mm-hmm. family and just seeing everything going on in that big square of space, all the sound stages, all the processes of making films. Seeing that old King Kong ride that used to be there from like nineteen ninety to two thousand two, incredible ride. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. And that was where it was like, okay, kid, you got to start making films. And actually, my first film was right when Phantom Menace came out, and it was on an old VHS cam, and we shot it in one take. It was our version of Phantom Menace before the movie came out. And it was done with me, my sister, and two other girls, uh, neighbors. And uh, my sister wanted to turn it into a comedy, and I kind of went a little bit Christian Bale on her. (laughs) <laughs> and I feel I feel kind of bad for that, but it was like, but I look I look back on that film, and a lot of people actually say it's better than the actual movie. <laughs> I'm looking at a styrofoam wall here, and I can say that's better than F- Phantom Menace. <laughs> but this is these are the issues when you start talking to everybody in their own individual fandom. You said all the stuff that's gone through with how you wanted to make films and what got you interested into it. What are some pieces of advice you would give to other people out there, other listeners, other students who would be interested in that maybe they want to make their own film, but they have no idea how to start or even if they should? Well, if you're making something like a drama or comedy, it's a lot easier to plan out because you can do it in a span of a few weeks and improvise while you're filming and you could get scenes done very quick and very well paced. When you're doing a film with special effects, you need a lot of time to prepare. You need a lot of preparation going in. When I started working on Kong, September 2010, I wrote the script. I had from then till May of 2011 to start filming, like to get things going. So I I hired everybody and everything. But we learned as we went along. We prepared as we went along with the journey. Um, But if you're working on a special effects film with large green screen elements or backgrounds and you want to create 
images of monsters, you want to be well prepared. You want yes. to have everything prepped. So my advice, if you're making something like that, give yourself two, one or two years to prepare and to get everything set up, rehearse the act, get the actors, plan out who's going to do the effects and so on. And therefore you'll have more time on your, and then you'll have more time to, and get it done faster. We had the problem of calling. We didn't know how it was going to turn out. And we spent almost, it's almost a six year journey of getting this thing finished. Yeah. But then again, um, Lord of the Rings was also a six year journey. Yeah, I know. So I know. My, you start somewhere. My next project's going to be a very Lord of the Rings esque project, um, but it's going to be a mini series. Um, I don't know if anybody knows about Inuyasha, which is my personal favorite anime of all time. Uh, great anime, definitely check that out. Um, but I'm doing a follow up series, which I'm writing, and then I'm also going to be turning into a mini series after Kong is finished. Well, that's another, something else to look forward to. Yeah. All right, Jack. Well, thanks very much for coming in today and um, no being problem. part of our show. No problem. I'm always up for free press. <laughs> free press it is. Well, you know what? It's the main thing of getting everybody out there and let's bring the people in from the community because you wouldn't really realize that, you know, sure, you can find somebody on YouTube. Do you know exactly where everybody comes from? That's and the big question. Right <laughs> where here, is your fan base? Yeah, right here in our back door, right, right here in our backyard, we have local filmmakers and they're going through the effort. They're, you know, hit or miss, trial or fail. You're doing something that you love. Yeah, so definitely check out Kong. Comes out uh, December 17th next year. Um, it's right on the mark of the 40th anniversary of the 1976 film. Sounds good. All right, well, that's going to be it for us here with Nerds of the North this week. Uh, we will be back next week. Uh, there's going to be definitely some more interesting things coming up. Aside from a lot of constant video game playing, I will get the chance to get onto Battlefront Live online, and I'll be able to let you guys know a little bit more what that's going to be like. But until then, this is DJ Padawan. And DJ Bodebo. And, of course, our special guest. Big Jack Films. All right, and we're going to leave you with one song before we leave. So from one, all of us here at 102.7 Chop FM, here is Lindsay Sterling with Elements.